Welcome to today's episode of Licentia Hub. If today happens to be the first time you are joining us, I will urge you to subscribe to our Licentia Hub channel so that as and when we release any new video, you will be notified to follow us accordingly. Our first question for the day reads, A patient at home has an indwelling urethral catheter. His care should include a. Clamping the catheter for two hours every day. B. Changing the catheter every month. And C. Irrigating the catheter once a week. Viewers, you realize that this question is talking about an indwelling catheter that a patient has taken home, specifically a urinary catheter. Now, how do we care for someone who has taken this catheter home? Catheter is one of the things that is most of concern to the nurse because it serves as a way that pathogens can travel to the urinary tract and cause infections. And so a nurse is always mindful on caring for catheters to prevent infections. If a patient has been discharged home on catheter, what are some of the nursing education that must be included? Option A is saying that you should clamp the catheter for every two hours in a day. Option B says that we should change the catheter every month. And option C says that we should irrigate the catheter once a week. Let us look at the various options given. Yes, of course. Anyone that is taking catheter home probably temporarily cannot pass urine on his or her own and so has to take it home. However, there should be ways that you have to train the bladder to regain its ability to function independently on its own. One of the ways of doing that is clamping the catheter every two hours in a day to observe for the patient's voiding pattern if the bladder has regained its full control or not. Option B says that the catheter should be changed once every month. Ideally, catheters ought to be changed if there is actually a problem. If the catheter is in situ for a long time and there's no infection, there's no blockade in the catheter tube, then we have no reasons to change that catheter. Option C says she irrigate the catheter every eight hourly. Catheter ideally should be irrigated at least every four hourly in a day or every four hours in a day. And so that makes option C also not part of our answer. So the correct answer here or the best answer here that we will go for will be the option A. So looking at the question on the screen again, you realize that Clamping the catheter for two hours every day will be included in the care for this patient as clamping this catheter will help the patient bladder regain its strength so that we can be able to remove the catheter fully so that the patient can now void without the help of a catheter, making option A our correct answer. Next question. The major test used to determine whether a person has been infected with tuberculosis is termed DASH test. A. Manto, B. Cops, and C. Brzezinski's. What is TB in the first place? TB is one of the communicable or infectious diseases that affect the respiratory system of humans which is caused by a bacilli bacterium. Now, looking at the test done for TB, option A says Manto. Manto test, which is also known as the tuberculin skin test, is one of the tests done to confirm TB. Option B talks about Cox. Cox was just a scientist who brought about ways that you can bring or ways that you can confirm TB. And so Cox has nothing to do 
in our answer. Option C, Brzezinski signed. This sign of Brzezinski is seen in meningitis, where the stiffening of the neck causes both the hip and the legs to be flexed when the neck is stimulated. That is Brzezinski sign, which is seen in meningitis. And so per this explanation, our correct answer will be the Manteau test, as the test that will be done to confirm TB as the question six to access. So our correct answer is the option A, Manteau. Manteau can also be known as the tuberculin skin test. And so if you see it being changed in the MCQs, it just means the same thing. Our next question. A patient with nephrotic syndrome is having hyperlipidemia. During your clinical teaching to a group of nursing students, you explained hyperlipidemia to be caused by low level in A. Albumin B. Glucose C. Sodium Viewers, this question is asking or talking about nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic syndrome is one of the disorders of the kidneys that is characterized by four main cardinal points or symptoms. One, hypoalbuminia. Two, proteinuria. Three, hyperlipidemia. And four, generalized edema, which is also called anasarca. Now, in understanding the pathophysiology of nephrotic syndrome is very key in answering such questions. Why is there hyperlipidemia? Let us delve quickly into the pathophysiology briefly. In nephrotic syndrome, because the basement membrane in the glomerular capsules is lost, large molecules or large plasma proteins like protein escape through that basement into the urine. That's why we have proteinuria. Because of the loss of the basement membrane that become porous, and so large molecules like protein escape through into the urine, that's why we have the first symptom as proteinuria. Now, as protein is being lost in the urine, albumin is also protein in nature. So the more protein is being lost in the urine, you are going to hypo of albumin. That's why we have hypoalbuminia as one of the manifestations of nephrotic syndrome. Now, as there is hypoalbuminia happening, the liver cells are being stimulated. The body goes to the liver to tell the liver that we are losing a lot of proteins. So please help us. And so in response to that, the liver cells release something we call the lipoproteins. And so these lipoproteins are carriers of protein. So from the name lipo, they are lipids in nature. And so the consistency release of these lipoproteins raises one's blood cholesterol. That's why we have the third sign of what? Hyperlipidemia. So the fall of the albumin level raises the concern for the liver to produce more lipoproteins to make up for the protein loss. Hence, we will get a manifestation of what? Hyperlipidemia. Now, as protein level has also dropped, there is a pressure we call oncotic pressure, which is all, which will also fall. And once oncotic pressure falls, it will draw or cause more free to shift into the interstitial compartment. And that's why we have the generalized edema or anasarca. Edema is just basically accumulation of fluids in tissues. And so when oncotic pressure falls, one of the one of the factors that will cause edema in the body is when oncotic pressure falls because of loss of proteins and so loss of protein will cause oncotic pressure to fall which will cause edema in the tissues as the fourth symptom or cardinal sign of nephrotic syndrome based on this pathophysiology briefly explained you will realize that it is the albumin level that has dropped that is causing that hyperlipidemia so quickly you knowing this in the pathophysiology let us go back to the question which is on the screen. And so you will see that in this question, they are saying that 
or they are trying to ask us that what is the hyperlipidemia or what is causing the hyperlipidemia so you will see that the so during the clinical teaching to a group of nursing students you explain that hyperlipidemia is caused by the low level of the albumin as i earlier on explained so you have no choice than option a being the correct answer as albumin so the low level of albumin is what is causing us to have high levels of lipids in the body because the liver is releasing more of the lipoproteins making our option a the correct answer next question the nurse should closely monitor a patient with popliteal aneurysm for which of the following complications a Reynolds phenomenon b pulmonary embolism and c thoracic outlet syndrome the condition mentioned in this question is called popliteal aneurysm let us split the words into two when you talk of popliteal where is our popliteal? Popliteal is just at the back of your knee. The space at the back of your knee. So you find your popliteal, we call the popliteal region. And artery that runs through that region is called the popliteal artery. Now, what is aneurysm? In medicine, aneurysm is just the dilation or the ballooning of a weakened area of an artery. So a weakened area of an artery which becomes dilated or a balloon in nature is what we call aneurysm. And so when that happens, or when so when there's popliteal aneurysm, it means that the artery around the popliteal region has become damaged, so it has become ballooned in nature. What complication would that come with? A is saying Reynolds syndrome or Reynolds phenomenon. What is Reynolds phenomenon? Renal phenomenon is one of the vasospatic disorders of the peripheral arteries. So that occurs at the peripheries. So you feel numbness at the peripheries, which is mostly triggered by cold temperatures. It's just like holding an ice block. Whether you feel numbness at that part, that is what we mean by Renault phenomenon. Now, that will not be a complication of popliteal aneurysm. So option A is out. Option B, pulmonary embolism. Yes, pulmonary embolism is a relevant complication of popliteal aneurysm because when there's aneurysm, blood flowing through the artery will be slowed down because it cannot flow with that force again. And when blood flowing slows down, the chances of clot formation is also high. And so when that clot forms, it can travel to any part of the body, even the lungs. And when it happens in the lungs, that's what we call pulmonary embolism. And so pulmonary embolism is a relevant complication of popliteal aneurysm. Option C, thoracic outlet syndrome. This is a condition in which there is a compression of the nerves and blood vessels around the thoracic region of the chest. And that has nothing to do with what? Popliteal aneurysm. So our correct answer on the question on the screen is the pulmonary embolism, making our option B the correct answer. Our next question, which reads, Mr. Kofi said, a 20-year-old farmer is on your ward with nephrotic syndrome. One of the underlisted is characteristic of Mr. Say's condition, except A, hyperalbuminia, B, proteinuria, C, hypoalbuminia. Nephrotic syndrome has been mentioned again, which I earlier on explained that it's one of the kidney disorders that is characterized by four main cardinal points. Let us look at the cardinal points again. One, proteinuria. Two, hypoalbuminia. Three, generalized edema, also called analsalka. And four, you can have hyperlipidemia. 
So in this question back on the screen, viewers, they are seeing now which of them is not part of our symptoms. We will not waste time in answering this question because quickly we will know that the hyperalbuminia will be the exception one, making our option A the correct answer. Thank you.